Unicorn Rainbow Farts, and the return of Cornholio. Space sucks, but Beavis and Butthead do the universe rules. Like Beavis and Butthead do America, the new film starts out very strong with an awesome action-packed intro. While their first film opened up to a pastiche of kaiju films, featuring a giant Beavis and Butthead stomping through a city and spewing fire from their mouths, Do the Universe opens with a cool Star Wars-inspired space chase. Beavis and Butthead are briefly rendered in full CGI, piloting a small spacecraft in what looks like a replica of the Death Star Trench, being chased by enemy ships shooting green lasers at them. It's a great, well-directed action sequence, plopping Beavis and Butthead into a scene from a high-stakes space opera to say things like... Space sucks! <laughs> that was cool. Then they blow up right before the opening title because they were looking at all the cool explosions instead of what was right in front of them. Seems fitting. While it is obviously improbable that two dumb teens, especially ones as comically dumb as Beavis and Butthead, would ever, ever get a chance to board a NASA rocket ship, writers Mike Judge and Lou Morton came up with a relatively clever reason as to how that would be possible in Beavis and Butthead Do the Universe. After Beavis and Butthead create a science fair mishap that leads to their school burning down, the two are given a court order to attend a NASA space camp, which was slated to be the prize for the fair's winner. This is because the fire Beavis and Butthead created has destroyed the records of the real winner, and the judge assigned to their case recently watched an episode of Touched by an Angel, inspiring him to give the at-risk boys a second chance. Once at the camp, Beavis and Butthead are obviously bored by all this science stuff, except for a docking machine that mimics sexual intercourse. So they spend all day and all night practicing the docking maneuver to the point that they become experts. The NASA astronauts, unfortunately, mistake their enthusiasm for the machine as them being technological prodigies, rather than horny boys who just see sex everywhere. The person who is initially the most gung-ho about Beavis and Butthead joining the space mission due to their surprising aptitude for the docking machine is Captain Serena Ryan. This assertive astronaut keeps misunderstanding Beavis and Butthead's clear and unhealthy sexual attraction to her as enthusiasm for the space mission. This is exemplified in one of their first meetings, where she tells the boys, I want you to do that for real, in space, with me. She means operating the docking controls in actual space rather than what they obviously think she means. However, one of the funniest exchanges happens when they're all fully dressed in their spacesuits, marching towards the launching rocket. This whole time, Beavis and Butthead have assumed they've been training to sleep with Ryan. You know how few people have done what you're about to do? Obviously, she means going to space, but the misunderstanding only gets worse from there. Only 256 men and 49 women. That's a little more than I was hoping, but you know, that's okay. She then goes on to add, That's not even counting the Russian dog and the monkey. Enough! Beavis and Butthead, as a series and a concept, always thrived on contrast. While it may seem to many viewers that the superficial appeal of Beavis and Butthead is their gross-out humor and slapstick shenanigans, the truth is that only works when they're in opposition to something more intellectual. So their stupidity is usually best served, like a lot of the best buffoonish comedy, when going against a straight man, or in this case, a straight woman. This worked great in the show, such as when their idealistic hippie homeroom teacher Mr. Van Driesen tried to get through to the boys using art or other outlets. And it was always hilarious seeing his efforts getting completely dashed by overestimating Beavis and Butthead's abilities and underestimating their lack of self-awareness. The same goes for Captain Serena Ryan, who, while in the NASA shuttle, takes Beavis and Butthead to the ship's cockpit to show them the sun rising over the Earth from space. Her speech, wonderfully delivered by actress Andrea Savage, is backed by a rousing and inspirational musical score. All of this makes Butthead's quick declaration once she leaves all the more hilarious. The Earth sucks. <laughs> One of the ongoing jokes among fans of Beavis and Butthead is how visually distinct they are, even when compared to other characters on the show. Everyone else in their universe seems to have roughly the same proportions as a real human being. Beavis and Butthead, by contrast, have long, bulbous heads completely out of proportion to their tiny, caricatured bodies, as well as exaggerated facial features that border on the grotesque. 
In Beavis and Butthead Do the Universe, when the wormhole in 1998 spits them out on a beach in 2022, the space-time anomaly of course attracts the US government to investigate. When government agent Madison looks at a sketch drawing of Beavis and Butthead, he immediately says in a grim tone, Whatever they are, they're definitely not human. In fact, Madison believing Beavis and Butthead are actually part of an advanced alien species is a running joke throughout the film. This includes a scene later on when he hears the pair on an intercepted cell phone call and states, It's crude, but they're learning to approximate human speech. It's the metatextual acknowledgement of Beavis and Butthead's outrageous designs on top of Cole's committed delivery that sells the humor. One of the more outlandish sci-fi concepts in Beavis and Butthead Do the Universe are the interdimensional beings known as Smart Beavis and Smart Butthead. The Smart Beavis and Smart Butthead variants are styled after Marvel's Uatu the Watcher, with pale skin, bald head showcasing somehow even bigger foreheads, pupilless white eyes, and flowing ornate sci-fi robes. Smart Beavis and Smart Butthead have traveled to meet up with Beavis and Butthead Prime to warn them that they need to enter a portal to return back to their own timeline, or the multiverse will collapse on itself. As the Prime idiots we know look on confused, Smart Beavis asks, Um, did you see the cartoon Spider-Man movie, perchance? Uh, no. Oh, that would have made explaining it a lot easier. With seemingly all the knowledge in the universe at their disposal, Butthead asks the most important question he can think of. Did any of the other versions ever score? No. No version of Beavis and Butthead has ever scored. However, instead of being dismayed, Beavis and Butthead Prime take that as a challenge to be the first ones. All the while, rather than their trademark chuckling, Smart Beavis and Smart Butthead react with comments like That is amusing, yes, quite jocular, yes, yes. mirthful, yes. The Smart Beavis and Butthead variants are a running gag throughout the film, with the most clever joke being the reveal that they are still really dumb since their plan was needlessly complicated. They are indeed the smartest Beavis and Buttheads in the multiverse. That just isn't saying much. The time travel concept is used relatively sparingly throughout Beavis and Butthead Do the Universe, despite it being the catalyst for the whole plot. Not to say there aren't funny fish-out-of-water scenes in which they confront how things have changed over the years. These include jokes like discovering what a cell phone is for the first time, as well as realizing how their childhood home has changed. But by and large, that's not the main comedic thrust of the story. However, one bit that really takes advantage of how society has shifted in the last couple decades is a scene at a gender studies class that Beavis and Butthead accidentally crash. In it, the feminist professor asks them to confront their white privilege. Now, to be clear, white privilege is a very real phenomenon with devastating systemic ramifications. As for Beavis and Butthead, well, let's just say they don't really get it. In one moment, a white student talks over a black student to explain the concept, hilariously shows the well-intentioned lack of self-awareness that can exist even within liberal spaces, while the film pokes fun at the earnestness of some of the students' often oversimplified view of white privilege, it also shows a pretty concrete example of its existence as well. One of the most iconic bits in the Beavis and Butthead canon is when Beavis transforms into the Great Cornholio, his manic alter ego. In the new film, after Beavis and Butthead steal a cop car because they misunderstand the degree to which the aforementioned white privilege would protect them from police, naturally they're sent to prison. When a police inspection comes up, a prisoner forces Beavis to hide his drugs, and Beavis takes that as an invitation to eat them. This, of course, marks the return of the Great Cornholio. What puts this scene above many of his previous appearances are the raised stakes, and the fact that not only does Cornholio incite a prison riot, he also forces the warden to partake in prison reform. While the film isn't purely on the side of all criminals, nor prison abolition, it does seem to be on the side of humane treatment. It also subversively displays white privilege, considering the warden decides to show Beavis mercy, which probably wouldn't otherwise be the case. The main plot of Beavis and Butthead Do the Universe is Beavis and Butthead's ongoing quest to find Captain Serena Ryan, now a governor, and have sex with her. Before they go to finally confront her, Beavis and Butthead each have their own fantasies about what it would be like to score. 
It's funny to see how hormonal he and Butthead are throughout the film, but when the audience actually sees inside his head, they realize that Beavis just wants a sweet girlfriend to cuddle with and also torture some ants. It gets even funnier when he imagines her as an avenging warrior princess in metal bikini armor, bloodily slicing up his bullies and taking him on a ride atop her rainbow-farting pegasus steed, which also happens to have Butthead's face. Butthead's fantasy, in which he's a pimped-out Lothario wearing a tacky fur coat and gold dollar sign jewelry, surrounded by beautiful women, is less original and comedic than Beavis's, but it does have a hilarious moment where one of the swooning women says, I heard you put your thingy in a girl's thingy. As mentioned before, one of the main conceits of Beavis and Butthead do the universe is that no Beavis and no Butthead in the entire multiverse has ever had sex, which given what we know about Beavis and Butthead isn't much of a surprise. However, that all changes at the end of the film. Beavis feels he has legitimately fallen in love with Serena, though he's actually fallen in love with Siri due to being unaware of how smartphones work. He's about to confess his true love to her when Smart Beavis swoops in and offers Serena a chance to travel the cosmos as she's always dreamed. She agrees. It's later revealed that Smart Beavis and Serena did indeed have sex. After a ceremony is held by Empress Beavis and Emperor Butthead, who awards Smart Beavis an I Scored medal. Meanwhile, Smart Butthead is awarded an I Watched medal, since he was hiding in a suitcase at the foot of the bed to watch the two do it. But the best part is the reveal of the vast number of alternate Beavises and Buttheads witnessing the ceremony seated in a futuristic space coliseum. It's a sight to behold and is an all-around epic and hilarious way to end the film.